Hello, City Talks music fans! How are you all going today? Thanks for tuning in to the Encore episode with Australian country artist Fanny Lunsden. My name is Saba and I'm the host of this music podcast, also the founder of the City Makugos brand. Did you enjoy the first chat with Fanny, in which we talked about the whole country scene and the land down under? That introduction by Fanny was a super interesting one, so if you've skipped that episode on purpose, I strongly recommend that you go back to it before listening to this one. In this episode, we're diving a bit more into Fanny's early experiences, which shaped her as a country muso and artist in general. There will also be a few super down-to-earth stories from her everyday life, including her interaction with fans on Twitter, for example, which is now called X. Plus, I feel like this chat is a great example of the Aussie sense of humor, when it comes to naming things, at least. So, without further ado, I'll let Fanny introduce herself. Uh, my name is Fanny Lumsden, and I am a singer-songwriter, um, like recording touring artist um, from Australia, and I um, I live on a farm in um in like regional Australia so about six hours from Sydney six hours from Melbourne um which I love and I am self-managed so I do I manage our whole career and stuff like that I work pretty closely with my husband who helps with that as well um and so we run two businesses including a record label which mostly does kind of merchandise as well as other stuff as well and production company and run a tour called the Country Halls Tour um where we put on shows in halls all over Australia. And I am also a mum of two little boys who you may hear in the background. They are meant to be going to sleep, but they are kind of loud. So, <laughs> Okay, but Fanny is not your first name. <laughs> I'm very aware of the double meaning. Um, yeah. People like to remind me like I hadn't realised, but um, oh yeah. Um, I It's also an old-fashioned name. Yeah. And so, so I... When I was at university, like, um, you know, everyone's always joking around and my uh, my friends began calling, my first name is actually Edwina and then my middle name is Margaret. And so they thought that that was hilarious, kind of old fashioned and posh or something. And so they used to tease me and say, Edwina, Margaret, Fanny Lumsden, mm-hmm. as a bit of a joke. Um, and I'm like, I think, you know, it was like around the time that Facebook started, which is sound makes me sound so old but like and all that kind of stuff and so like that became my Facebook name as well and then people just started shortening it and calling me Fanny Lumsden um and saying the whole thing like they'd always say Fanny Lumsden and when I'd meet people they'd be like oh you're Fanny Lumsden and so and that was around the same time as I started playing music um as well and um so it was kind of my nickname then and it became my nickname um and then it just became my stage name but it's also my nickname it's just what people call me um Fanny and also it just people don't forget it it's Mm -hmm. it's been brilliant for marketing even though that wasn't why I chose it I never chose it it just chose me and then I I lent into it and I and I've I loved it like you're gonna send sell a lot more I love Fanny t-shirts than you are I love Edwina t-shirts so um yes yeah, and no. so we 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 I like to I like to like lean into the playfulness of it and um but always kind of keeping it like innocent but you know it's fun. Yeah, true. And um and you mentioned the t-shirt and I remember that I think it was at the beginning of the pandemic when you know artists were not touring so you guys lost all this income and everybody started pushing out merch a bit more and I remember your t-shirt popped up on my feed and and it was it said I love Fanny and I was like how great for marketing you know and you don't even have to like yeah you know think too hard about it so yeah so do you know that one we actually started that that merch range started in 2014 oh like um yeah so the I love Fanny range has been around for a long time and it's kind of my highest selling thing so we just kind of reinvent the colors but um 
yeah it's been it's been as a long like it's been always been my merch <laughs> Um, but apart from Fanny, um, I also read that your first band, the one that you had in Sydney, was called initially, uh, and I have to quote it, uh, Fanny Lumsden and the Glorious Horse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> obviously, obviously it didn't fly really well with the radio station, so you needed to change it, right? <laughs> so um, Yeah, the, there's a like the kind of the ABC of our, like it's like our BBC. Um, we have got a lot of support from them over the years and they're really amazing to us but they wouldn't say my band name and so I was like well gonna have to change it yeah but then also the band that you uh, from as far as I read uh, the bands that you take on the tour with the country host um with with it is called Fanny and the Prawn Stars yeah is that right so who comes up with all these names is that you just being playful and kind of matching it oh okay so it's all your invention <laughs> great yes name. it is it's all mine um we that one came from a time that we um we were doing country halls christmas shows and and so we had a bunch of halls and and for our decorations for christmas um we put we had big pictures of prawns and then stars everywhere so it was kind of like aussie christmas theme a lot of aussies have prawns on christmas because it's summer here and you know they're yummy um and they're and so um we called them the prawn stars that those nights and then it kind of just stuck because it was kind of I just it's funny it's a funny play on words and you know it's fun now that all the beans have been spilled and we know where all the stage names come from in Fanny's bands let's dive a bit more into the artist's musical roots and education in the first episode of this podcast, Fanny talked heaps about growing up in the country and being surrounded by music. She also mentioned that it has shaped her view of the world. But who does she take after in that aspect of her life? Everyone definitely is very musical in my family. So that's one, I'm not, yeah. Um, everybody plays like one or two instruments. Right. everybody sings um so it just wasn't music industry like it just wasn't like bands and stuff it wasn't that world everyone played like classical piano and like cello or like violin or viola or whatever um lots of strings um but everybody played the piano and then everybody sang and so we all sang and we'd all like sing harmonies and um there was a lot of music just no one was in the music industry so or scenes yeah so you're the first one you're like the trailblazer for your yeah. yeah 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 I've got like cousins and um like aunties and stuff that are like in musical theater and in opera and that kind of side of things but no one else is like in this side of it okay. I mean like we are now my brother is now because he's in the band but like yeah we're kind of that first of that kind of side of things so I didn't, I, there was a lot to learn. I didn't learn. I didn't learn it growing up. I didn't learn the business growing up. I had to learn it myself. Yeah. Of course. And, um, but then um, you went to high school, but you went to study and you didn't choose music as your kind of like major, right? So it was com something completely different. So tell me about how that happened that yeah. you were studying something else and then you went into music. Yeah. So I, I, um, I did music, like I said, my whole life, like classical music, lots of music in my life. And I think I kind of just did, I wanted a break when I finished school. So I went to university and I studied rural science, um, which is like agricultural science, really. Um, and so, yeah, I did a science degree um, and and that kind of majored in ag, the ag world. Um, and like I did sustainability and wool in high fashion <laughs> um, as my major. And it was, yeah, really a really like different kind of world. But um, it was during that process, which is, you know, I was doing a really factual degree. So it's like, you don't, you don't, there's no room for opinion in a science degree. And that, I didn't really understand that. And it didn't really sit with me as a person because I don't like being told what to do. Um, <laughs> and so I started, um, I started writing songs um, like after class and sometimes I'd miss class. Um, or be late. I'd always be late um, because I started writing songs, and I think it was just that creativity just needed to go somewhere, and um, it just started going into songs. Okay, so when I read about that, I was like, "Wow, that is such a brave choice," you know, go to into agriculture, you know, and then 
suddenly pivots to music. But that that degree that you did on and the thesis that you wrote on uh, uh, wool sustainability, right in the high fashion, that is very interesting. It must have been some time ago. That was kind of a, very innovative for that time, I guess, to talk about. It was, uh, yeah, it was actually. Um... In my conclusion, I concluded that my like findings were about five years early to have any real impact. Like when I would interview like designers, they no one really was clear about what sustainability meant then. It was very kind of a buzzword that no one knew what it really meant. And no one really understood, like, you know, people understood wool, of course, but not really the value in that sense. So yeah. You're right. I was a bit. It was a little bit early, I think. So, do, do you do anything with this uh, sort of kind of um, you know fashion and sustainability in your career now? Like, do you kind of implement it in your stage clothing and you know like the costumes and stuff? Um. Yeah. I mean, I get to play with fashion a lot. Um. And I suppose I just I like to advocate for wool. My sister now has a brand, like um, a business where she sells wool children's clothing called the woolly brand um and so I you know I understand all of that so I can help her advocate it advocate for it um it is something cool that I could definitely look into although most of our awards here in Australia are in the summer so it's very hot but there's like wool's very versatile so maybe it is something I should do more of who would have thought hey Sustainability, wool and rural studies would have been probably the last thing I would have said if anyone had ever asked me to guess Fanny's educational path. On the other hand, I reckon we should thank whoever invented those studies for accidentally pushing Fanny back into music making. What an unusual journey, right? But Fanny's got more unexpected stories to tell about her career in the music business in the land down under. You're about to hear another one of them in this next part of our conversation. You also mentioned in that introduction that you now have like a record label, but I also read that you once Googled how to start a record label, which obviously yeah. I have as well, <laughs> but I haven't started one whilst you have. So when was it? Was it before you became the artist or was it when you already started and you thought about, you know, having your own one so you wouldn't be dependent on anyone else? Yeah, it was It was all during. Um, I We were about to put out our second album and I had had some offers from major labels. So like, you know, big labels um, had offered me deals and um and like I think I had like three big offers and like you think as an artist that's going to be your dream like that's that's your dream right to like to get offered but I was just had seen a few friends go through that process and be very frustrated and not very happy and I knew I wasn't a big enough artist yet to have a huge amount of say on how things went if I signed to a deal and I knew that it was going to be like a a bit more of a like an ego decision rather than a smart business decision signing to a big label and so I then was kind of looking at different options and like we could work with the little label or I could but then when I started looking into all the labels I was just like oh we could just start our own because the size that we were I knew we needed we needed the all of the income to kind of help propel us forward to get bigger um at that stage and um, otherwise it would start of like kind of, yeah, wouldn't really, wouldn't really propel us enough. Um, and so, yeah, so we, I literally Googled how to start a record label. <laughs> was that any helpful, you know, Googling it or did you? Yeah, it I, yeah, yeah, it was. I read lots of blogs and lots of like, like different things. There's like, there's a lot of paperwork basically. Um, and there was just lots of stuff I had to set up. So, you know, there's actually quite a lot of help on the li online about, you know about that kind of stuff but yeah it was pretty funny um I think it just sounds a little bit more it always sounds more impressive than it actually is these kind of things like <laughs> you're like yeah I kind of built in some forms and and like branded it this way and now I've got a record label and I learned very quickly that I didn't like having a like running my own music through my own record label it was I didn't like the like um re running the retail side of it in shops I love the merchandise side on the road and we run our own store from here like our online store but um I didn't like retail and stocking shops and stuff like it was, I, I couldn't keep up with it so it was good it was a lesson <laughs> right 
So does it mean that the first album that you released was you you financed it yourself? So it was completely independent. Oh yeah, I, yeah. We've always um, financed everything. Um, so well, the first record we crowd actually no, the first two records we kind of crowd funded the first okay. like the recording of it, just the recording. Like it wasn't huge amounts of money, um, but we've always funded all the marketing. Um, and even now, like we like I am signed to a record label now, but they they'll put up the money for the recording, but we, we pay for the majority of everything else, everything else. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's great that you are able to uh, kind of, you know, finance it and then um, get some money out of it. So I guess you're not at a loss. It's still a profitable business, I guess. Uh, yeah. Sometimes the last few years have been hard. I think, um, you know, coming out of like COVID itself is actually, you know, even like, because I don't know, like a bunch of different reasons, like it wasn't too bad itself, but it was more the aftermath and then kind of catching up and and now like costs of everything and touring and yeah, it's 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 um it's a bit of a battle, but um not one I'm going willing to lose. <laughs> okay, so I gotta be honest with you. As a solopreneur female myself, I'm pretty impressed by all the things Fanny's managed to achieve so far and the professional ventures she runs. She's got a family on top of that. And those of you who know anything about the music business will surely agree that it's quite a challenge to juggle all the business-related engagements, which tend to happen late at night, with raising kids and living a fairly normal life. So I've assumed Fanny must be a super organized person, always staying on top of her life and career. Well, it turns out that she's a human being like the rest of us. And I don't mean it in a bad way. She's just a very approachable, authentic and realistic person who doesn't mind sharing the truth about being a muso and what we think is a glamorous world otherwise. So in this last segment of our conversation, we're talking about the more down-to-earth aspects of running a music business in Australia. Some of the projects Fanny describes might have been mentioned in the first episode, so you can always go back to it for the context. But for now, everyone, Welcome to Fanny Lamsden's world. I'm not. No. Yeah, really? I'm. I'm not organized. That's. I'm organized when we're touring. I am. I'm very organized when we're touring. Um. No, I'm not like a strict organized person. I am, but like, I. I mean, I am. I have got it all together. But like, in terms of how I manage my time, I'm not. I'm not crazy and strict about it because I think that I would be too stressed if I did that. Um, my management of stress is to make everything much more fluid. Um, and so, yeah, like last night when we were meant to do the interview and I was rehearsing and then I had a live stream <laughs> 10 minutes later and I was like, oh, my God, double booked. So, you know, sometimes it's just chaos. Um, and I was doing that while my kids ran around my feet and, um, you know, so... And I oh, you also couldn't do it without like the people around me, like my husband, um, he is in the band. He's also like, he's essentially the co-manager as well. Like I might be the one that's coming up with strategies and saying what we're going to do, but he's very much an implementer. So like, he's kind of like the operations, he'll, he'll kind of get shit happening, which is, which is great. Um, and then I've got a great band on the road and like everyone in the band has roles. Like, you know, the, my drama does all our tech he runs the tech kind of side of things. And then we've got a, you know, we've got a sound um, sound guy as well, but, you know, the drama kind of liaises and then tells him what he needs. And um, and I have an assistant who helps with the country halls tour because that's very ad- admin heavy. Yeah. Um, and then we've like booking flights and stuff. That's amazing. That's an amazing part of it is having someone like that to help with all of that kind of really time consuming things. Because um. But yeah, it does mean you have to be on all the time. Um, but at the moment, we're trying to be a little bit more chilled. Although, you know, we're just like the last kind of six months have been really full on putting on an out, al- putting an album out. So, um, yeah, it's I don't know, I don't know. I just let it all blur into one and just kind of get it done as I can. And um, I'm not like up at five and having a cold shower and then like doing my emails or anything. I'm not that kind of person at all. I'm like sleeping and then my kids on my head and I'm like, oh, get up and then go do some coffee and maybe I'll do a bit of yoga, but probably wouldn't. And then like, 
you know, eventually get to my computer and then I'm like, ah. <laughs> and then, yeah. So I don't know. I just kind of be efficient when I can and just be kind to myself otherwise. True. And uh, from what I'm hearing, you've also been able to build like a great team around you, like a community. Uh, so, you know, you guys kind of work like one organism and I guess it's much easier to do stuff if you trust people as well, you know, and you've known them for years. But on that note as well, and I have to quote this because I found it somewhere. In one of the interviews, you said that there is sometimes no line between you as an artist and you as a person, which couldn't be great but it can also backfire on you many times so how do you kind of reconcile it sometimes you have to be a mom you know because I know that you also take kids on tour with you sometimes or, or always I don't know so and being a working mom in the music business I, I guess it's very tricky so how do you you know kind of try to reconcile it like put it in its own you know kind of box or like you know put the mom hat on and then the director on is that difficult uh no I just I just um I think part of me as an artist and my philosophy as an artist is being true to myself, like being myself. I am me all the time and I never step into artist or step into mom. I just am me. And so that means it's all very blurred and it means I make great friends out of fans because, I, you know, there's just I get to meet such wonderful people everywhere. But, yeah, it does mean that it is kind of hard. It is it, it's hard to separate it because I have entangled it so much. Um, but, like, even though I share a lot on the internet, I there is a lot that I don't share. I just make it feel like I share heaps, <laughs> I think. But um, I don't know. I'm, I think that I just by... Like whenever I do anything, I just make sure that I'm doing it to the like to how I feel um, reflects me as a person, and I don't really feel any need to kind of separate it. Um, I don't like my kids like you know if I'm doing signings and stuff now they're getting bigger. I don't really want them like out there because I think it's really weird for them to see that. Like it's not really a normal thing for like kids to see people lining up to see their mum like that's weird um and they don't really understand it either like they're just like like they get a bit annoyed and possessive and and so and like also weird that people would just know them I find that's really something that I have to kind of be careful with as well is that like it's weird that someone would be like oh hello like blah 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 like I know this about you and they'll be like why do you know that like and so yeah I now they're getting bigger I am trying to separate them a little bit just by keeping them kind of out the back <laughs> okay but about your relationship with the fans as well and um, I don't know but I oh, we follow you mostly on Twitter I guess and you do share a lot it, it, it does seem like you kind of you know share a lot of your life but I think maybe it's not deliberate but it's a very good strategy in a sense you know to kind of like gain new fans because you are being yourself on social media and what I mean yeah. by that is I loved that tweet that you posted um something about how do you get tickets to the chicks and fleet foxes and the national and I'm like Fanny Lamston being an artist asks on Twitter how she can get tickets to another artist show I'm like you know because for us mere mortals who are fans we're like they just get this like automatically <laughs> they just you know just call someone up and they're like can I get tickets that was amazing. And then you posting, you know, that you finally got them and someone kind of got them for you. So, um, yeah, and you're laughing, but uh, for, for fans, this is something very authentic about you that you kind of share, you know, because we all think that you guys are some kind of magicians or like you have like out of this world access to everything else, but it's not like that always, right? Not at all. Yeah, it's really not. I really didn't know how people got tickets like that. And that really was so genuine that I was just like, Oh, I was like, whatever, this is an absolute, like, I just thought it'd be one of those tweets where you get like two likes or whatever. Um, and then, yeah, the publicist wrote to me and was like, would you like some tickets? I was like, yes, do I get them? Yeah. <laughs> you have to ask. I just didn't know. Um, yeah, I think that I, it's something that I'm really like, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know how to explain it. Like I, I'm conscious of and I'm not conscious of because I I just like I just can't do things that are not me like to the point of my songs right like I sing all my own songs that I write myself and if like when I was recording this album for example um somebody um I mean like you know I hadn't finished one of the lines in one of the songs and my my producer said oh like what about this like try this and I sang it and I was like oh yeah that works and we we lay it down um, but then 
after like a few weeks later, I'm getting the mixes and I'm listening and I was like, oh, I, I, I got to change that. Like, that's not my words. Like I wouldn't say that. I don't believe me. And so I had to change it. And I've done that multiple times. And if it, it just kind of and reflected across everything, if something doesn't feel like I would do it, I would say it, I would be like that, then you're not going to believe me. Like, and so if I don't believe me, like you don't believe me. So I've like always just really stuck to that and really leaned into that and like into the less glamorous, less smoke and mirrors side of it because I was like, oh, come on. It's all bullshit. I don't know what I'm doing either. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, but, but, you know, I guess the, the, because, you know, apart from being like a music blogger and maybe knowing a bit more about the music industry, I'm primarily a music fan as well. So, you know, I kind of was reading through these tweets and like, I follow you and I'm like, that is so funny that she would even share that because some people, they put on a face, you know, they put on the artist hat and they don't, Oh, to, yeah. but you, but I guess people and fans if they got to know you but they can call you out on your bullshit you know like if you if you post something which is not genuine they'll totally. know so yeah true story yeah yeah and I just think it's a, it does just does like it does me a disservice to be like a bullshit like it's not helpful um for me it makes me feel gross and it, it makes this connection less true so um I have no illusions that or like I tried to make sure that I don't project any illusions that I'm some kind of something that I'm not. Um, you know, I live on a farm in a house that I rent. Um, we don't buy, we don't own it, but we love living here. And I live near my family and they live on a farm, but like, I don't own this place. And, but I, I get to live here. Um, we have a very like normal life um, outside the music stuff. And I think that just, I think notoriety or like fame um twists things a little bit into this it's a very weird mirror that it's all just doesn't really exist but I think that the connections matter and I think the connections that you have with the people that spend time and energy and effort and like have connection with the songs or with you as an artist or with you as a person or with some whatever element it is that is real and that is important and so if you are fake about projecting any of that then it just won't stand up and I I don't think I could do that like I just am not that kind of person and um yeah I mean some people can and it suits them well and they get to do that and that's their artist thing and they get to be that and then they get to go be their own self but for me I couldn't do it so yeah but the funny we get uh online and you know like as a musician is the funny that is in real life can we summarize True. okay yes yeah. and on that note ladies and gents Go and connect with Fanny Lumsden wherever it is that you normally follow artists. I think you'll agree that she's a great and approachable person, keen to share stories and lessons learned from her experiences in the music business. I've thoroughly enjoyed this chat, so many thanks to Fanny for agreeing to be a guest on this podcast. And look, I haven't even needed to edit out any noises made by her kids. I guess they knew their mom was busy working and were being very good that evening. As you've learned from this chat, Fanny is an independent artist who runs nearly 100% of her career from home, so to speak. So please support her in any way you can. You can start by listening to her music and sharing it with your friends. Or maybe get the famous I Love Fanny t-shirt. You'll turn heads wearing it, guaranteed. Don't forget Fanny has also created a playlist with her Aussie country artist recommendations. Check it out, you'll find heaps of names there that I didn't even know existed. The link to it is in the show notes. And speaking of support, I'd love it if you would follow this podcast wherever you normally listen to it and check out my other Silly McWiggles related channels, the blog, my YouTube channel and other occasional music side hustles I run. It's just me, myself and I hiding behind the Silly McWiggles brand. So your follows, likes and shares mean literally the world to me. Lastly, it's a tradition on this podcast that I finish it with a sample of music by the artist I've just interviewed. So stick around after the music jingle has finished to hear Fanny Lamsden's song. My name is Saba and you've just reached the end of the City Anchor episode with Fanny Lamsden. Country music ain't that bad after all, hey? Thanks for listening. Till next time.